Aaron, welcome to the Happy Engineer Podcast. I can't thank you enough for making time, man. It's great to have you here. Zach, thanks for having me, buddy. I've been pretty fired up to do this interview. So uh, things going well oh, it's, for you? It's never been better. It's never been better. And the feelings yeah. mutual ever since our first chat. I, I will uh -huh. acknowledge you for a moment, Aaron, that there's, you know, I've talked to thousands of people in my lifetime, and there's only a handful where in that first 15 minutes, I really deeply feel heard and connected and appreciated mm. by that person. One of them was Stephen M. R. Covey, Stephen Covey Jr. He, he's someone who stands yeah. out for me. And you're in that yeah. category. I just deeply yeah. was moved by our first conversation. So uh, thank you yeah, for being here, man. That. This is awesome. Does that mean I need to send you like fifty dollars or something? <laughs> you were saying such a kind <laughs> remark. You you put me in the same paragraph is Stephen Covey. I like, I may send you a hundred. Well, don't we, you don't we need to send go. me anything, but uh, I really <laughs> do mean it. There's, there's certain people who just have that listening ability you, and, and you bring so much yeah. wisdom. So, and, yeah, and that said, Aaron, one of the things you told me when we first met that I wanted to start with, cause I think it's important for the context, you know, the, the engineering leader listening just heard this preview with all your resume and who you are. And it's a pretty Im impressive roster of accomplishments. But you mentioned to me that you grew up poor. Yeah. And I was wondering if you'd be open to sharing us what that was really like for you. You know, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. My dad was a great man, high character, very honest man of integrity. Uh, my mom was the spiritual leader of our family, grew up in church. But my dad had no aspirations to work. He was like, he was good. You know, he wanted to hunt and fish on the weekends and, uh, he was good to the family. Right. But he had no aspirations to work. And I remember, I don't want this to be the rags to riches story, but you asked the question. So just for context, we grew up, there were four children. I'm third older brother, older sister that passed away this past January. And then I've got a younger brother and I'll be 60 in March. So when I was a child, I remember certain things, a lot I don't remember, but some things that really stood out and this will frame what we're talking about. I remember my dad as a general contractor. When I say general contractor, that sounds like really impressive, but he was the guy that dug the footing for the house, like with a shovel, wow. not a back hole. And then he poured the concrete, he built the house like with a hammer. A lot of people don't even know what a hammer <laughs> is. It's all air guns now, right? With a hammer, he drove every nail oh, wow. to build the house. And so physically he was much of a man, right? Very strong, really took care of himself physically. But I remember during the winter, how we would go to our pantry to get things out to eat. And my mom during the summer had put canned goods in our pantry and nailed a board over it so that we would have something to eat in the winter. Wow. And I remember watching my dad, he had to roof a house once and it was during the winter and he had to sweep the snow off with a broom and then get up and tear the roof off and re-roof the house. And I remember that was a real pivotal moment for me because I remember thinking, I don't want to work that hard physically, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't that I was lazy. It was just that I didn't really know what was out there, but I knew there was more than physically working that hard. And then when I was seven years old, we lost our house in bankruptcy. Like they came and repossessed oh, wow. our house. This is a house now that was 600 square feet, two bedrooms, four children. Uh, my dad gave $6,500 for this house and then they repossessed it. And I remember moving in with our cousin and living there until we found a house just north of Nashville in a little bed and breakfast area called Madison, Tennessee. And I remember the house and I remember hearing the conversations with the landlord, how the rent was $60 a month. So you can imagine what this house looked like for $60. And so when I turned 13, my dad asked me if I wanted to help him on a summer project. And all my first question was, can I make some money? Sure. And he said, yes. And so I went to work helping my dad turn this beauty shop into a pawn shop. And I didn't even know what a pawn shop was. When we finished it in three months, I asked the owner, Hey, uh, could I work here? And he started laughing. He said, what would you do? It was like 13. <laughs> and I said, I'll do whatever you want. Anything. I'll sweep, I'll clean up. Uh, I'll wipe these showcases off. I don't even really know what you do, 
this business is a mile from my house and I can walk here or after school. Mm -hmm. So he hired me like shortest interview in history. <laughs> he hires me to work there. Wow. And really from that point on Zach, I worked every day my entire career. And so God was really good to me. I made some real aspirational goals as a young man. I won't take you through all those. Some of them sound like I'm boasting and I don't mean for them to be, but we opened our first business when I was 18, Robin and I got married two weeks out of high school. Wow. And I said, Robin, we can't mess this up. Like I may never get this chance again. And then, you know, when I was 27, I sold out to a fortune 500 and that gave me kind of a springboard to do some other really cool things. That's really amazing. So that's where my journey started. So if I can back up to those childhood years and a couple of those formative mm -hmm. moments, what were the mindsets that growing up in that environment placed in you? Any, any beliefs maybe that you still yeah. hold to this day sure. that were really yeah. formative? What were those? Yeah. You know, it's funny. My daughter and I I've got a daughter that'll be 40 her next birthday and another daughter it's 37. And my oldest daughter and I were talking about this very thing. And it's kind of funny. A lot of you can't see this, but Zach, you can see it. Like I carry a money clip with cash. And uh, in the console of my truck, there's a couple of packets of money and I've got some money in my house. It's like, I don't want to be broke. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I can physically see that, because I remember as a kid, like we didn't have any money, but I didn't really realize at that time how poor we were. I, did, I didn't think about it then. But all I thought about was how hard my dad was having to work and then the things that we didn't get to do and mm -hmm. the clothes that we had to wear. But I sound like I'm throwing my parents under the bus. I'm really not. They tried hard. See, the difference then and now, too, is when I was a child being raised in the 60s, it was all about survival. It wasn't about personal and professional development. And yeah, it wasn't. It was about mere survival. And I just remember thinking when I was a kid that uh, I wonder if there is another way. And if there is, I'm going to work as hard as it takes to get there. So it embedded in me a lot of grit and determination yes. and perseverance. Yes. And uh, I think a lot of the kids miss that today as a result of like, they've always been in a comfortable environment. They don't really have any significant tasks. They don't really have to do anything. I was going to do a little rant this morning on a Facebook live about that very topic yes. It's about we're doing our children an injustice by not requiring them to do some significant task and get a job and make their money and save it and et cetera. I know that's not where we're going on the podcast today, but that's still I just remember yeah. how important it was that we pitched in as a family. We did things as a family and yeah, we really work hard. So I'll have to say I attribute the level of grit and determination yes. and perseverance I have to today as a result of that. Aaron, what, on the topic of grit, just following the thread wherever it takes us here, but sure. if someone did not grow up in an environment that created that in them from a young yeah. age, for better or worse, their parents didn't give them those opportunities or they chose not to take them, whatever that situation was, how does someone curate and and authentically become a person yeah. of grit and determination if it wasn't yeah. trained in from a young Ingrained age. You. Yeah, is that something yeah. people can do? Mike Michalowicz, uh, that name may ring a bell to some of you. He called me recently and he's writing a new book and he wanted to interview me for this new book. And uh, a part of my story, I had an automobile accident back in 2021, uh, excuse me, in 2001. I had the automobile accident about 22 years ago now. And he was asking me why it takes these transformational experiences to really get our attention. And I said, it really doesn't have to be that way. Like intellectually, we're smart beings and we should be able to go, you know, if I do these things, the result is going to be X. But if I don't do these things, then I'm going to have to settle for why, whatever that is for you. And I think we can choose to, even if you weren't raised that way, I think even the audience listening to this interview today can make a very intentional choice to do the right things. And I teach this in our mastermind, Iron Sharpens Iron. We talk at length about making a very concerted effort by making a choice, by enlisting accountability, 
by subjecting yourself to the scrutiny of other people that mm-hmm. are in your environment. It's just like going to your group and saying, Hey, like I wasn't raised the way big A is talking about, but I want to do those things. I want to be successful. So let's reverse engineer the things that I'm doing. And I'm going to ask you as my trusted advisors or have an accountability group that you meet with weekly. See, it's imperative that we have community around us because isolation is the enemy of excellence. Mm -hmm. And if we want to take our life to the next height, we have to surround ourselves with people that we totally are reliant on and dependent on for holding us accountable. Yes. A lot of people though, they hide behind that veil. They have a facade. They don't want you to know their aspirations because if they don't accomplish them, then they don't have anything to explain. Or if they've got great goal settings and dreams and a vision board, and if they don't expose that to anyone else and they don't accomplish it, then they won't appear to be that failure. And see, we maximize our goal setting and our vision casting by exposing it to as many people as we can that we trust. And then when we do that, naturally, we're going to want to succeed. We're going to do the work. And so I think more importantly, that's a long way to answer your question, but more importantly, it's exposing yourself in community, having accountability, trusted advisors that you meet with on a regular basis. So I want to talk more about those points, but I will say I totally agree. And one thing I coach my clients on, we do a a lot of work around the idea of vision and goals. And I tell them all that, you know, the vision, if you keep it to yourself, if you don't communicate to that trusted group, that inner circle, and and in some cases in career context with your boss and with the people who need to know what you want to create with your career, then it lacks power. A vision that's not communicated lacks power. And the more you're well, willing to put the scripture it out there. as a believer, it says where there is no vision, the people perish. Amen. Yes. And so we've just got to be able to share it. Uh, people are looking to follow leaders. If you're head of your household and you're leading your children, you're leading through example and you're doing your children an injustice by not casting vision, by not being held mm-hmm. accountable, by not having these trusted advisors, they learn through example. And so primarily things are learned that are caught, not necessarily taught. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. if they see you doing that on a regular basis, they're going to uh, probably do that as well. So if you weren't that person, you could instill that in the children that you're raising today. Before I dig into what it takes to succeed in these areas, I want to really quickly go back to something you said that really struck me. And I'm just curious. And I think it's important because a lot of times, especially on a podcast like this, you bring someone amazing like Big A. And for those who don't know, Aaron goes by Big A. So rightfully so, I just found out today. So it's like you have this, and you mentioned rags to riches type of storyline. And people can sometimes become a little disenchanted by that, or or maybe that's what they're seeking. They just craving to have their own rags to riches story, but you you made a comment like, I don't want this to be seen as a rags to riches story. And I'm wondering if you can tell me what prompted you to say that I don't want this to come across that way. Why is that? Yeah, What I've been trying to do, Zach, is make the interview less about me and more about application to the listener. And so a lot of people were raised in a blue collar, white collar environment, and they've had ample opportunity. They can't really necessarily relate with that. But you hear a lot of people today saying, I was broker than a convict and now I've got more money. I know what, you know, yeah. I don't want it to be that kind of story. The only reason I even said that is because you asked the question to give it in context, yeah. kind of where I came from. The truth is, is that we're all adults and we can choose mm. and see, that's the most important part of this interview. If you don't hear anything else, hear that is that you can make a conscious decision today in order to get up and do the right thing. You don't have to have a rigs, a a rag to riches story. You don't, (laughs) it it doesn't have to be that. Like you can be in a really good place today, like financially, but there is so much more. And I don't necessarily just mean financially. I mean, there's such a opportunity today to grow personally and professionally and spiritually and relationally and, Physically, there, there's so many opportunities that are afforded us today that 
maybe weren't as readily available when I was a child. And so quite honestly, I told somebody the other day, I said, if I had had the internet in my early years, my first five or six businesses, I could have exponentially grown faster and had a bit of more success than I've even been able to accomplish over these past four and a half decades. Uh, you have so many opportunities today. Yes. You can learn online immediately. You can sell products. And we've done that. We've manufactured products overseas and imported them, sold them on Amazon, and we never saw the product. We never dealt with the people that were manufacturing them or selling them. And I'm like, how great is this, right? We, we sell this product all over the world and uh, we never see it. We never manufacture it. We never touch it. We never house it. We never mail it. It's we never amazing. store it. We never have any. And it's like, how good is that, right? And so there's so many opportunities today that we have. And I'm just going to cut to the chase, Zach. I try to say things with as much tack as I can, but <laughs> quite honestly is uh, we're lazy. Oof. We're lazy. There's so many opportunities today. And I teach my children and my grandchildren. I'm like, man, you just do 10% extra and you're going to stand head and shoulders above the norm, right? I remember one time when I was in the seventh grade, I brought home a C on my report card. Judy Bell was the English teacher and she was so hard. This lady, my paper had these red lines all over it. It was unbelievable at how you, you can listen to me talk until I wasn't really good grammatically or in English at all. I brought home a C on my report card and my mom said, never again. I said, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Never again. I said, this is a hard class. I said, that's average. And she said, yeah, that's just as close to the bottom as it is the top. And you're above average. You can do better than above average. And it really instilled in me this desire that we don't have to do a lot to be above average. So if you're hearing me today, it's like you have so many opportunities. You have so many yes. chances to get involved in accountability groups, mastermind groups, peer advisory groups, civic organizations, surround yourself with competent, trusted people that you can aspire to, that you can reach up, get in a safe environment where you can let that facade down, where you can be vulnerable and transparent. And that scares, those words scare people mm -hmm. to death. But mm -hmm. I just want you to know that real strength begins at the intersection of vulnerability and transparency. The place that you go, hey, I don't have it all together in this spot, right? We're all knuckleheads. There's so <laughs> many areas that we do good in, yes. but we all have those blind spots, right? We have superpowers, we have kryptonite, but we also have blind spots and the blind spots will invariably trip you up and see, you can't see it or it wouldn't be a blind spot. So you've got to have people that you regularly talk to that you regularly are sharing with so that they can point out how buddy of mine called me out one day. We've been friends 45 years. And he said, I heard you embellish a story the other day. And I said, I didn't embellish anything. And he goes, yeah, you did. I heard you tell this guy you've been all over South America fishing. I said, I have. He said, no, you haven't. You've been down there twice. And I said, uh, well, that's all over. He goes, that's not all over. You fish the Amazon <laughs> chain. You fished about 10 miles of the 4,000 mile Amazon chain. He said, the reason you said that is you wanted that guy to think you were a big deal. Mm. And man, it pissed me off, Zach, really, when he said that. But then I started evaluating why I said it. You know why I said it? I wanted that guy to think, think I was a big, big deal. deal. Right? Yeah. And that's a blind spot. And so I had to start getting more accurate with the way I depict things. He said, otherwise, who's going to ever believe you? When they find out right. that you're embellishing right. stories, they never know if it's this way or that way. And so... Listen, I could stand here the remainder of the interview and tell you blind spots that I have, right? Because yeah. I've been in a mastermind group now for 25 years, every week for 25 years. And it has allowed me an opportunity to be able to go, hey, I'm good in these areas and I can serve. Yes. But over here, I need some support. I, I don't know how to do this thing. I'll share one of my blind spots instead then, Aaron. So people don't think it's just about big A. I resonate with the comment your mom gave you about the C. In my household, my mom was very clear, Zachary, you have one job and your job is school. You may not have a side job earning anything if you're not bringing home straight A's. And you know, my home was all about academics. And I remember one time having a conversation with my mom about my grades and I did earned straight A's all through school and was valedictorian sure. and all this. But I asked her one time, like, mom, what, what if I did bring home a B? 
because I think I had a class that was on the bubble and I got a little nervous. You know, what happens if I bring home a bee? And she told me, well, honey, it has nothing to do with how much I love you or anything else. It's just, I know that you're capable of straight A's. Right. You're incredibly right. smart and God's gifted you with this incredible brain. And so for right. you to not get A's means that you're not doing your best. It means yeah. that you're leaving your potential on the table and that's not how we live. That's not how we do it. And it, it really wasn't a long conversation. It was a really quick thing, but I had this really great thing taught to me to show up and do my best. Well, that translated to a lot of confidence in school. I was smart, et cetera. And then sure. that positive became a huge blind spot for me growing up where I placed my identity in my intelligence and I built this fixed mindset around what it meant to be smart and needing to always be the smartest person in the room in many contexts and totally missed the fact that perfection and and the paralysis that that creates and uh and, and honestly, the yeah. ego that came with some of that, that plagued me. And I remember being in a leadership training, week-long leadership training in my career at Whirlpool. And we got to the final day and there was a feedback, a really authentic feedback session with everybody in your group. And this one gentleman in the training with me, Aaron said, Zach, it's been amazing to get to know you and you really are a super smart guy, but I don't really feel like I know you at all because you're just too perfect. Mm. You always have to come across like you have it all together and that you didn't actually open up. I don't feel like I actually saw any part of you this whole week. Mm. And it crushed me. I felt like, how is that possible? And honestly, didn't want to receive it at all. You mentioned yours kind of pissed you off for me. This, it just, I got numb. It was like, this, how is that possible? And I'm so thankful for that moment. So, Aaron, maybe. You know, the truth is, though, and I bet your mom's answer would have been this. If you had brought home all C's, but she knew Zach was giving her best, that would have been fine if she knew you were giving your best. See, mm-hmm. that's what it is in business. Like, we're not going to all succeed financially at the same level. But the guys that I coach all the time are the guys in the mastermind all the time. I tell them the things to do. And then a week later they go, well, I didn't do this and I didn't do Mm. this, or I tried it for six weeks and it didn't work. I said, six weeks, I wear shirts longer than six (laughs) weeks. Like you gotta be consistent. And that's what it is yeah. when you surround yourself with accountability. It's like, man, I want to see you busting it. I want to see you going for it. Robin and I started our first business when I was 19 years old. She was 18, two weeks out of high school. She turns 18 in March. We get married in June, two weeks after she graduated. And I set her down to our kitchen table, this little condo we bought for $19,500. And I said, Robin, listen, we can't mess this up. Like you come from a family broker than mine and we can never mess this up. We worked around the clock like literally around the clock. And before we had kids, we were at the store at night. We were handing out flyers in the day, flyers on windshields at Kroger's parking lot. We would send out messages. I mean, it was constant. Like I've literally shaved in the sink and changed clothes Mm. and sponge bathed in the stock room and opened the store the next day. Mm. See that level of determination doesn't exist anymore. You can't hardly get people to work and they wonder why they're not successful. So if you're hearing my voice today, determine what it is that you want first, which is a whole nother podcast interview within itself. But most (laughs) people, Zach, don't know what they want. We've got to be proactive in our life. We can't be reactive. We can't just be going out there, getting bigger, better, shinier, faster. Just give me more. That's not going to satisfy you. You've got to really align with what your zone of genius is, not your zone of confidence, but your zone of genius. You've got to do what really gives you energy. And I can't imagine 43 years now I've been self-employed. I can't imagine punching the clock, doing something I hate so desperately, figuring out a way I can't wait till Friday gets here so I can have the weekend. Like, listen, if you're hearing my voice today, stop doing that. Figure out a way to change that. Life is too fragile. In my book, View from the Top, I wrote one column, one chapter about uh, being blindsided. See, we don't realize the frailty of life. We don't realize how quickly our life can change. And it's too short 
in order to live in a miserable environment where you have golden handcuffs and you do something that you despise each and every day. Yes. So first exercise is to figure out what it is that you want. I mean, sit down, literally, I wrote a document called, what do I want? Be sure and email me or at the end of the interview, we'll give you a website. You can get that document for free, but go through it yes. and say, yes. where do I want to live? How much do I want to make? What do I want to give away? Like, what is it exactly that I want? And then you'll know when you've won. That's so beautiful. And would you be open to sharing the accident story from 2001? Because sure. I think in terms of yeah. the fragility of life and being blindsided, there's no better Mm. moment to talk about how quickly sure. things can shift and how to overcome. But yeah, tell us about that. And it did, man, things were so good. Like when I sold out to the fortune 500, I was 27. I took about a year and a half off, got bored, gained 50 pounds, went back, bought the company that I started with when I was 13. We grew it about four times the size it was. I was working three days a week. My partner was working the other three days a week. We had a beautiful home here in Nashville, fancy cars, kids in private school, you know, it's all the stuff, right? I'm painting a picture so you can understand what I'm talking about. We had a place on the beach with a couple of partners and it was like, pinch me. This is my life. It's hard to believe I was 40 years old and we go to our church every Wednesday morning to pray with our pastor for our families and for our church. And I had just left there at 730, August 1st, 2001 headed to the office and uh, there was a guy crossing a four lane highway to catch a local bus. And he didn't look my way and just didn't see me. And I ran over him and uh, I won't take you through all that horrible right. experience, but uh, three days after the accident, the Vanderbilt trauma unit called me and they said, uh, Mr. Walker, he didn't make it. His name was Enrique. Hmm. He was 77 years old oh. and, uh, he had been warned countless times not to travel alone. He just didn't see you. And so, uh, I sold the business. I retired for the third time. My wife said, I've retired more than the law allows. I retired <laughs> and I said, I've been chasing money my whole life. So I took a five year break. I didn't do anything for five years. My wife came to me again. My wife's been a trooper. Robin and I'll celebrate 43 years of marriage oh, that's uh, next beautiful. June. She came to me one day and she said, listen, you know, our kids and our future grandkids, they're going to need you. And you're not really doing anybody any favors by not working, by disengaging. James Ryle called me on a Saturday morning. He was a promise keeper speaker. He was in our mastermind group. Dave Ramsey had invited me years ago to be in his mastermind group. And uh, we met in Dave's office every Wednesday from about seven o'clock on to about eight thirty. And, uh, God really, his timing is always perfect because it was right after the accident when he invited me to join that group. And, um, I needed that group. I needed people around me, but I couldn't get over this thing. Like I couldn't forgive myself and I just couldn't work through it. And then James called me and said, uh, it says in Isaiah chapter 41, take the chains from around your neck and move on. He said, it's time you were moving on. And it really rattled me. It really got my attention. So I was able to work through that. You know, you don't get over killing somebody, right? Mm -hmm. God gives you the grace that you learn how to deal with it. And so it was a paradigm shift in my life. It was a time in my life to where I said, you know, nobody would have cared that I'd had any measure of success. And I started thinking about my legacy because we're all creating a legacy. Yes. Whether you're doing it intentionally or not, you're creating a legacy. And I said, if I had been killed that day, what would my legacy be? Mm. And I said, you know what it would be? It would be poor kid from Nashville, Tennessee, makes enough money to retire at age 27 and nobody cares. Oof. And I thought, man, that is not what I want my oh, legacy my to be. I said, I want Zach's life to be better as a result of having interacted with me. I want to be the giver, not the taker. And I said, God, if you'll give me another chance. I'll turn the ship around and I'll start giving and helping, encouraging and edifying and teaching. And that's what we've done. So we started Iron Sharpens Iron Mastermind. Today we have 150 members. We're in five different countries around the world. And God's really given me a vision 
to grow it. And so we're helping very, very successful people and people that want to be successful, accomplish their dreams and help them grow in every area of their life. And so each and every day I get an opportunity to get up and train and teach and encourage and help people avoid the landmines that I've had to go through Yeah, and show them that we can be the giver and not the taker. I'm brought to tears at this part of, and nobody cares really resonates for me, Aaron. Could you give a word of encouragement? If any engineering Mm -hmm. leader listening has a weight has those chains around their sure. life. Maybe it's not yeah. at the level of having sure. you know, killed someone in an accident, sure. but the regret or the shame that they might carry from something yeah. in their past. What <laughs> was a great it? Question. What was it that when that mm. voice was spoken into you and you let go of that, that self forgiveness, yeah. can you just yeah. talk through that? Yeah. Maybe encourage people. Golly, that's the part. It's funny. You and I've never talked about this. That's the part that was the hardest was it wasn't even my fault. Like I don't Mm -hmm. drink and I wasn't on a cell phone and I wasn't speeding. Like I wasn't doing anything wrong. Right. If I had been, I probably never would have gotten over, but I wasn't doing anything wrong, but forgiving myself. I told my buddy, I said, man, if I had just jumped on the interstate this morning and gone down the interstate and rather than Gallatin Pike, he said, yeah, you know what might've happened? You might've hit a school bus and killed 50 kids. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. He said, you can't do that. Here's what I come to realize. This is one of those moments right now for the interview. Listen, you can allow whatever devastation in your life to continue holding you back and defining who you are as an individual, or you can go, you know what? That's who I was. That's what happened. It was the financial devastation. It was that affair. It was that substance abuse. It was whatever it was. But today is the day, like I'm declaring today is the day that for no longer will I allow that to identify me. Or you can continue to muddle in it. You can crawl under your desk in a fetal position. You can suck your thumb balled up in a ball. You can do whatever you want, or you can go out and live your life like God created you to live. You just got to go, you know what? This is who I was, and this is who I am today. And my wife came to me. She grabbed both shoulders, and she looked at me, and she said, we need you. Like we need Oof. you to get over this. And I was like, man, man, she's right. Because she didn't sign up for this. My mm-hmm. kids didn't sign up for this. My peers and colleagues didn't sign up for this. I got to bring my best self in order. Nobody can be me, but me. And so I said, I've got to make a decision consciously today. So if you're listening to my voice <laughs> today, I don't care what it is. If you've killed somebody, whether you've had an affair, whether you've had drug addictions, alcohol addictions, whatever it is today, that's not who you are today. That's who you were. So we went through an exercise. I normally don't share this, but I'm going to share it. I feel compelled. A friend of mine told me that there's an exercise he did because I couldn't get over it. I I, like, I, I couldn't let this thing go. And he said, here's what we did. And he said, I suggest you write a letter to yourself Hmm. with this offense, whatever it is, you fill in the blank. And he said, get together with friends. And as I've mentioned a number of times in this interview already, I'm Christian by faith. So I got together with six of my friends, Robin wrote a letter and I wrote a letter and it was February 23rd of a given year. And we burned those letters. Nobody read the letter. I I wrote the letter, put it in an envelope. My wife wrote a letter, put it in an envelope and we burned it. We had praise and worship music. We had prayer time. And we said, never again, never again. Are we going to deal with this issue? It is not going to define us. So I can point back to February 23rd of that year that I let it go. And it has so relieved Mm. me. It has so given me the ability to point back and go, that's, that was then. Yes. And this is now. Yes. See, this is not a trial run. This is not a practice (laughs) run. This is our life that we're living right now. And are you going to squander it? Yes. Or are you going to maximize it? And I just consciously made the choice that I was going to go for it. And I want to tell you, man, these past two decades have been the best two decades of my life. I don't want to repeat the school. Yeah, I don't want to do it again. I agree. Right. I learned the lesson. And that's the reason I do these interviews. It's I want so these good. other people to let this stuff go, man. Go burn I it. I really appreciate you sharing that. And I love when you take a bold action along with the choice and the declaration 
of a new identity. And in the spirit of things I've never shared, one of my moments, people who know my story, I, I divorced as an adult and had a really, really challenging time right after that in depression and embarrassment and shame. And, you know, I allowed all of the weight of that to become my identity for a period. And my moment of decision that I wasn't going to let that divorce define me, I took my wedding band from my first marriage. It was winter time and went out to the St. Joseph River here where I live. And same thing, I it took that ring with me and had a time of prayer and fasting and just a, a declaration of the fact that yeah. this was my past and not my future. And I, yeah. I hurled that ring out onto the ice yeah. and I could hear it. It was a totally silent morning, really early, still dark out. I could hear the ring kind of clink, clink, mm. clink, clink, like disappear. And, you know, it's wow. at the bottom of the river now, but it's just powerful. So I hope the engineering leader listening is encouraged to, to make that choice and to start living it. One more thing I want to get your experience and expertise on before we wrap today, Aaron, this is just so powerful. Mm -hmm. We probably could end the interview 20 minutes ago. It'd be powerful. But you mentioned accountability several times mm -hmm. today. And I feel like even with my clients, and we have a lot that we do in the spirit of accountability, but for many of us, I don't feel like we really understand what true accountability is mm -hmm. and its power and effect yeah. and its leverage in our life. And if anything, sometimes it's seen as something that is a crutch or it's because I'm weak that I need this. And it's like, I wish I could just do it on my own. I don't need all these other people. Can you just speak to accountability yeah. and really what that looks like and its true power and effect in our lives? You gotta make a determination of whether it's gonna be real or a facade. Just under 30 years now, I've been meeting with an accountability group Chris Freeman, Hugh Morris, Randy Butler, we meet 6.30 every Monday morning. And we have been now for just under 30 years. Wow. Uh, this particular group, we've been meeting for 15 years. I've worn out two other groups and we get together every single week. And there's nothing in my life they don't know, nothing. They know my finances, they know about intimate relationships. They know about my thought life. They know about my superpowers, the kryptonite, the blind spots, everything in my life. They know about everything. And we meet every Monday, six 30, we get together, we do life together. We also live in uh, close proximity of each other. We vacation together. We've been friends for 25, 30 years. And some of you are like, man, I don't even, I don't even know anybody that long, Right. but I didn't either at the beginning. You see, the important thing is that you get started and it's yes. not going to look exactly like I do it, but you have to design it. But what I wanted to do, Zach, was to be better. Like I knew I couldn't be better on my own because you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And you need people around you challenging you. And oftentimes men are confronted with things that women are not. Women are confronted with things that men are not. So for me, I can't have mixed gender and it's got to be all men because I need to talk openly and candid and out of respect. I can only do that with men. Women are listening to me today. Get a women's accountability group. I don't recommend that you have accountability with the opposite sex. I think that there's so many things that you need to talk about that that wouldn't be really a safe move. A lot of people say, well, my wife or my husband holds me accountable. That's okay to a degree, but there's times in Robin and I, as I've mentioned earlier, celebrating 43 years, there's times that I need to go to these men and go, Robin doesn't get it. Like she doesn't get it. She's sure, not a man. Sure. Robin and I talk about things oftentimes and she wants to understand she's very supportive, but she's not a man. She doesn't understand how men think. I don't understand how women think she needs women accountability partners, right? Because I know I drive her crazy. I'm a high D <laughs> on the disc profile. Sure. I'm, I'm red line all the time. She doesn't understand that. It's like, I don't get that. So my point is, is that everything in my life is an open book to these three guys. Yes. And they call me out. They encourage me. Or they hold my arms up when I'm tired. They lend me their strength. They lend me their support. They throw the flag on my BS. They're mm -hmm. like, Hey, no, this is not right. I've known you too long. If I need to go to them and say, I'm thinking about doing this, they have all the history. Yeah, I don't have to catch yeah. them up. They know all the history and they can say, no, this hasn't worked well for you in the past. 
or you should do this. Here's the thing. And it's very scary. Men primarily, it's very scary, but you got to make a decision. You got to either make a decision to hide behind your ego and pride and not let anybody in, or you've got to make a decision to let that veil down, be vulnerable, be transparent for the benefit of getting better. And so I just elected, I want to be better. I want to maximize it. I don't want to get to the end, Zach, and lay there on my deathbed and go, man, I should have done this. I should have done Mm -hmm. that. I wished I had been more vulnerable. Nobody lays on their deathbed and goes, man, I wish that I had been more private. I wish nobody had known me. I wish nobody, nobody does that, right? We all say we should have let people in. I guess the bottom line is, is that I want to live life to its fullest. Yeah. And I can't do that alone. Isolation is the enemy. And if you're going to maximize life, you can go faster alone, but you can go further together. Yes. My best friends and I use the phrase being fully known as our identifier around that. It's just like, I want to always have at least Mm. a few people in my inner circle who I'm fully known with. And that's exactly the spirit of what you're talking about. And I can tell you, isolation, you mentioned at the beginning Mm. of our interview, the enemy of excellence. And for me, isolation was without a doubt one of the key root causes to my ultimate demise in my first marriage and the failures that defined the first chapter of my life, which is now ancient yeah. history. But, um, whew, okay, Aaron, I know everybody's going to want to get connected with you. And before I ask you my last question today, can you just share with us what's the best place for those who want to explore Iron Sharpens Iron mm-hmm. and view from the top? Where can we Thank go you. to just get more from you and explore this amazing yeah. work that yeah. you're doing? Yeah, we're on all the social media platforms, but the easiest thing to do, Zach, would be to go to viewfromthetop.com, like Victor View, viewfromthetop.com. My phone number's there, my email address. Somebody said your phone number. I'm like, well, if people are going to call me, they need my number. So uh, my phone number's there, my email is there, uh, all of our social media platforms are there. And uh, yeah, just reach out, check us out. Listen, a lot of you have heard this today, and this is such a foreign concept. You're like, man, I don't even know where to begin. I would suggest going to viewfromthetop.com. There's an application there. You're not bound to it. It's not making any formal commitment, but it allows me and you to talk together, right? And there's never any arm twisting and high pressure. I don't believe in that because I want people in our community that want to be there. But if you just want to learn more and you're testing the waters, and you say, hey, this sounds like a good way for me to maximize my life. Reach out. Let's just have a conversation, but fill out that application. I'll call you and talk to you, and we'll see what it looks like. So yes. reach out to us, viewfromthetop.com. Please do it. For the engineering leader listening, if your heartstrings are tugging or your mind, the wheels are turning, don't overthink this. Just take action. To Aaron's point, there's no commitment, and I cannot speak highly enough about Aaron, his leadership and his team and the work they're doing at ISI. It's tremendous. So with that, I will always end in this place and love to hear where you take it. That great engineering, just like great coaching and the work that you do, I believe that questions lead, answers follow. And if we want better answers in our life, let's pay attention to the questions that we're asking ourselves. So for the engineering leader who's been with us in this whole chat today, who wants to experience that next level of of success in their career, but also leave that legacy in in their life that you talked about, what would be the best question that you would lead them with today? Yeah, you've got to ask yourself two questions. First of all, do you have the right mindset? Do you have a growth mindset, not a fixed mindset? Very important. You even touched on that earlier in the interview. And second of all is that we're afraid of failure. And I'm like, I don't know what everybody's so afraid of, you know, it's like, Hey, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We'll do something else. And I just say fear missing an opportunity more than you fear failure. I mean, I could lay in bed at night and think, would it have worked? And I just want to go out there and try to accomplish the dreams and the goals that God has placed on my heart. And so I would ask myself, what is it that I really want? Do I have the growth mindset and am I willing to do the reps? And if you're willing to do that, those are some of the hardest questions that you could ask yourself, but just Mm. have the can do attitude. My mom would always say, can't, couldn't do it and could did it all. 
And I was like, that's me. I'm fixing to do Ooh. this thing and I'm not afraid to fail. Fear missing an opportunity more than you fear failure. And you too can go out there and have a successful and significant life. Ooh, that's so good. I really appreciate it. Well, Aaron, I just want to acknowledge you again for your generosity, your incredible work and the legacy that you are leaving. We were chatting before we hit record today that there's thousands of interviews that you have brought your wisdom and your heart into the world. And it's such a gift. So thanks for sharing that with me and the happy thank engineers you. today. I can't thank you. Enough. Thanks a lot, Zach. It was fun, buddy. We'll see you. Hello, my friend, Zach White here again. And I wanted to let you know that's all we've got for this episode of the Happy Engineer Podcast. Thank you so much for investing your time with me today. It is an absolute pleasure to be able to bring you this content. Just as a reminder, it would be amazing if you would subscribe and share this episode with any other engineers you know who may benefit from this. And if you're like me, I hope that you'll take some notes and more importantly, take action. In our audio version of the podcast on Apple Podcasts and any place that you go to find podcasts, there's a little more content from me about this episode in the debrief. If you really want to hear about how to put this into action, I'd encourage you to go grab that. But thank you for joining us for the video version of our interview today. And again, can't thank you enough for helping us to get the word out about the Happy Engineer podcast and what we're doing. If there's any way we can serve you, would love to do that. Go find us at oasisofcourage.com or reach out to me on social media at Oasis of Courage. And don't forget again to subscribe and click the bell to have notifications of upcoming releases of new episodes of the podcast. As always, I want to leave you with this. If you stay in your comfort zone, you're not going to grow. So let's crush comfort, create courage, and let's do this.